In this video, we will be talking about the dynamics of circular motion. That is how we can calculate and make predictions related to circular motion and what causes circular motion. We will review first our understanding of acceleration when you're undergoing circular motion, and then we will proceed to talking about what causes circular motion. So, centripetal acceleration, that is a term we've seen before. The centripetal acceleration is the radially inward acceleration that an object experiences while undergoing circular motion. Here we can see a figure illustrating uniform circular motion, where an object is going in a circle at a constant speed. Since the speed is not changing, there is no tangential acceleration. There is only an inward acceleration describing the fact that there is a turning occurring. The radially inward acceleration is given by the speed of the object squared divided by the radius of the circular path. Even during non-uniform circular motion, there is an inward acceleration of v squared over r but there would also be a tangential acceleration reflecting the changing speed. Now, what causes an inward acceleration? Well, we know that from Newton's second law, it's a net force that causes acceleration. We will sometimes call the net inward force the centripetal force that is responsible for an object following a circular path. There must be a net inward force if you are undergoing circular motion. So we know from Newton's second law that F equals MA, so the sum of the forces in the radially inward direction, which you can call the X direction if you want, must be equal to the mass times the radially inward acceleration, which is v squared over r. That's the only thing that's really new about dealing with circular motion and Newton's laws. Be cautious. The centripetal force is not a force. There isn't a new force called the centripetal force. It is merely what you identify as causing the net inward force whatever it may be. It may be a friction force, it may be a normal force, it may be a tension force, it may be some sort of air lift force. Whatever force or forces are causing a net inward force, we characterize those that force or forces as the centripetal force. I will never see a force on your free body diagram that is labeled as centripetal force because it's not a force, it's a classification. Let's try a conceptual question. During the sharp left turn, you found yourself hitting the passenger door. So you're driving a car, you're making a sharp left turn, and you find yourself hitting the passenger door. What is the correct description of what is actually happening? Let's see an example. A sled with a mass of 25 kilograms rests on a horizontal sheet of essentially frictionless ice. It is attached by a five meter rope to a post set in the ice. Once given a push, the sled revolves uniformly in a circle around the post. If the sled makes five complete revolutions every minute, find the force exerted on it by the rope. Okay, so here's an illustration of that sled. We want to find the force exerted on it by the rope. So let's write down everything we know. We know the mass of the sled, it's 25 kilograms. We know the radius of the circular path, it's the length of the rope, 5 meters. We also know the period of the oscillation because we know that it, the sled makes 5 revolutions every minute. That means 1 minute 
it takes to make five revolutions. So it takes 12 seconds to make one revolution. That is the period of oscillation or period of rotation. We want to find the force exerted on the sled by the rope. We can call it a tension force because this is a rope. And I'm going to call this F sub T for tension force to distinguish it from period. Next, we draw a free body diagram. And I have and I've showed a free body diagram of the sled when the sled is at the rightmost position. There's the weight of the sled, the normal force. There's a tension force to the left. And then there's an inward acceleration equal to V squared over R. Then we need to draw a coordinate system. And the coordinate system we should choose such that the positive direction for one of these axes points in the direction of acceleration. And here we've set the positive x direction be pointing toward the center of the circle so that the acceleration will be positive. And then finally, we apply the second law since no forces need to be resolved into components. The second law says F equals MA. The sum of the forces in the x direction is mass times the acceleration in that x direction, which is V squared over R. And the only force acting in the x direction is the tension force. So here we have the expression. However, we need to know the speed of the sled, which we were not given. But we can figure that out by recognizing that this is uniform circular motion, and the speed can be calculated from the circumference of the circle divided by the period. That's the distance traveled per time. If we plug that into the expression here, and then we square everything, one of the r's will drop out, and we get this nice expression for the tension force. Plugging in all the values that we were given, we find that the tension force is 34.3 newtons. That rope better be able to handle that much tension. So in this case, what was the centripetal force? It's the tension force. It's the tension force that is responsible for the inward acceleration causing the circular motion. Let's try another conceptual problem. You swing a ball at the end of a string in a vertical circle. Because the ball is in circular motion, there has to be a, quote, centripetal force. At the top of the ball's path, what is that centripetal force? Or in other words, what is that net inward force? Okay, now let's try another example problem. This is a bit more challenging of a problem than uh, the previous one. For a car traveling at a certain speed v, it is possible to bank a curve at just the right angle so that no friction at all is needed to maintain the car's turning radius. Then a car can safely round the curve even on wet ice. At what angle beta should the curve be banked? Well, let's figure it out. First step, draw a free body diagram. So here's the car, we have the weight, and then we have the normal force, which is normal to the surface. And we're banking the curve at just the right speed so that this car will go in a circular path even without friction. That normal force is the force that is responsible for the circular motion. It has a component in the direction inward to the circle. But we should really draw the acceleration so we know which way it points. The acceleration is inward toward the center of the circle. Then we draw our coordinate system with the positive x direction being in the direction of acceleration. We are not using a slanted coordinate system here. And then we resolve the normal force into two components. To do that, we need to figure out what angle that normal force makes with either the x or the y axis. So we need to do a little geometry. This is the angle beta, which is the same as this angle, which is the same as that angle. So n cosine beta will be the vertical component since beta is measured from the y axis. n sine beta will be the horizontal component. 
Next, we apply the law, the second law. In the y direction, there is no acceleration. So we have n cosine beta minus mg equals zero. And then we see that the normal force is mg over cosine beta. Likewise, in the x direction, the sum of the forces is ma, and the acceleration in the x direction is v squared over r. In the x direction, we have the force of n sine beta. We can replace that n with what we found previously. We notice that the masses drop out, and we see that we have sine of beta over cosine beta, which gives us tangent. So we can finally conclude that the angle that you should bank the curve at so that you can undergo circular motion at a certain speed, even without friction, is the inverse tangent of the speed squared divided by gr. We can see that the mass of the car is irrelevant for the banking curve. And we also see that uh, there are some conclusions we can make about how much we should bank the curve based on the situation. The faster you go, the greater the angle you should use so that you don't slide upward. Likewise, the smaller the radius, the larger the angle you should use because a small radius uh, path requires a very large angle so that you don't slip. That's why when people do uh, donuts or are drifting with their car, it's hard for the car to keep track of the ground. And lastly, on a planet with a smaller free-fall acceleration, it would also require a larger angle for your road to be banked at so that the car wouldn't slip. And one more thing we can do, and we probably should have dealt with this first before considering uh, special cases, is whether or not this is dimensionally consistent. That's meters squared over second squared divided by meter per second squared times meters. That will drop out. That'll be dimensionless, and it better be because you can only take the inverse tangent of a dimensionless quantity.